This video goes through the algebra of how you apply advanced knowledge in a dual mode approach. So the previous videos in this chapter have generally focused on finite horizon algorithms, those without terminal constraints. But dual mode algorithms deploy terminal constraints and this impacts on how target information can be included. Now, the dual mode algorithms of chapters 4 and 5 made an explicit assumption that the target was constant in the future and therefore used no advanced knowledge. And thus we need to modify the algebra that's available in those chapters in order to include advanced knowledge. Now here's a minor point that if you want to keep things easier, then you could say, well, I need the terminal constraint to work with a constant target because then I can assume a, a fixed feedback is optimal. And if you want to do this, you may choose to assume that NA must always be less than or equal to NC. Now we're not going to do that in this chapter, but a pragmatist might say that will make my life just a little bit easier. So the approach we're going to do. Here we're going to use the autonomous model approach. Now you'll find that in the literature very few people actually do it this way, but I happen to think that it's more convenient and transparent. So we're going to use a trans an autonomous model that captures both the transient mode and the terminal mode in a single model. That means we're not dealing with two different modes and then trying to combine them together with the messy algebra that entails. So it's not necessary to do it this way, and alternatives do exist. And whatever approach is taken, the algebra will be somewhat messy. You cannot avoid that. And that's due to the number of different states and inputs and things that have to be taken into account. Viewers who are not interested in the algebra and just want to go straight to the illustrations should go straight to the next video. So variation in the target. What we're going to do is define an autonomous model to capture the variation in the target over the prediction horizon. So here is the typical assumption that we made and we made in the early videos in this chapter. We're going to assume only so much advanced knowledge so that the target becomes fixed n a steps into the future. Now if you want to write a model which now captures how the target changes as you go forward, you'll see okay the future information I have currently is rk plus 1 up to RK plus NA and I've used a capital R here to basically denote that this is the cut down version with only NA values in it. If I move forward one sample and what you've got to imagine is this, this is within the prediction stage not within the real time then what's the relationship between the equivalent vector one sample later? Well obviously the RK plus 2 was in the second position and one sample later it's in the first position. The RK plus 3 was in the third position and now it's in the second position. And of course what you'll notice is I've just updated the index by 1. What's the relationship then between these two vectors? Well clearly you've got this sort of shift matrix which I've written here with the only difference being that there's additionally an I here in the bottom column. So I've called this matrix DR. So what you've got is the relationship between the future target vector at the current sample and the next sample is given by the shift matrix. So capital R future K plus 1 equals DR into capital R future K. Now obviously we will also have future disturbance information but the best we can do with disturbances as a rule is assume that it's constant. So if I want to include the disturbance information into this update equation you get this equation at the bottom. So you'll see I've got R future minus the disturbance. That's um, the, sorry, over here, R future minus disturbance, that's currently. And then I multiply it by the shift, and I get R future minus the disturbance at the next sample. And actually, this is the equation I'll probably be using. Now, if you look at the videos in, in um, video 4.9 and 5.13, you'll see that we used a particular form of predictions. Now it looks a little bit messy, but we needed this. You'll see your phi x is your underlying dynamic, which shows you that the dynamic is stable. And then we had a term 
which comes about essentially because of the integral action in order to ensure that you meet a non-zero steady state and allow for disturbances, so that's that second term. And then you had a term which was your degrees of freedom, the CK and how they come into the equation. And you could get a similar definition for the um, definition of the current input. So those are the basic state update equations that we used in the earlier chapters. Now what we did in the earlier chapters is we assumed that R and D were constant. But what we're going to do now is we're going to allow for the fact that R and D are not constant, but we also said, okay, what's the corresponding steady state value of the state and the input for the system to, to basically track the given target assuming there's a given disturbance and we had this form of equation so that was given again in the earlier chapters and we said therefore there's a fixed relationship th through these matrices KXR and KUR multiplied by the target minus the disturbance and that gives you the implied steady state XNU. So what we can do is we can update our performance index and say I'm now going to use deviations between X and the implied steady state. But the key thing is the implied steady state is now time varying. And you'll see I've got a similar thing over here for the input. The implied steady state is time varying. And you could argue that this change in the performance index is equivalent to basically doing things like r minus y squared. So the autonomous model formulation. So there's my prediction equation. There's my update for the target information. And there's a missing k plus 1 there. Never mind. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put all these equations into a single update model. So what are the things that update? The x updates. The C updates, we did that in the earlier chapter, and this R term updates. So you see, I've built an autonomous model with a state which has got X, it's got C, and it's got the target information. And now what I want to do is say, what are the relationships between these from one sample to the next? So if I look at XK plus 1, which is this top equation up here, you'll see I've got the phi times the x, I've got the b times the c, and I've got this bit here um, multiplied onto the r minus ld. I've got an update equation for ck plus 1, which was covered in the earlier chapters, and I've got an update equation for the target information, which you'll see has got this dr down here. So I've ended up with an update equation which says zk plus 1 equals psi zk. So I've now captured both the transient mode and the terminal mode in a single autonomous model which has an augmented state and that makes life nice and convenient in terms of the algebra. In a similar way I can define what the input is which is this equation up here and you'll see you essentially get this KZ term which relates U to the current augmented state. So what have we got then? So our sensible unbiased cost, you'll notice that the implied steady states are time varying to allow for the fact that the target is time varying. We've got an autonomous model which says this augmented state, zk plus 1 equals psi zk and uk equals minus kz zk, that's our update dynamics. And what we want to do is want to combine these two. So the next thing is to say, okay, in my cost I've got terms like this, xk minus XSSK plus I, which I've written down here. Can I write that down in terms of my augmented state Z? And of course the answer is yes. So the XK is just this term here, I000 times ZK. And of course the XSS we did on the previous slide comes through this KXR term and we just need to pick up the relevant part of the Z matrix. But what I've done is I've said first of all it's KXR times R future minus LD. But then you can say alright but this is part of Z so you'll see I've gone 0, 0 and then KXR times that term here or times ZK. And if I combine all this together which I'm 
I'm saying quickly, but you can pause the video if you want to look at this algebra slowly. The bottom line is the deviation in the state is some k times the augmented state z. And that's what we really need. So the term in our performance index is just something times our augmented state. And in a similar way, what you can find is that the deviation in the input, uk minus ussk, is some k times our augmented state z. So now we've got some very neat equations. And of course, the messy algebra is actually setting up what this kzss is and this kxss is. But once you've done that, everything looks quite neat. So what have we got? There's our unbiased cost function, but we've just shown that the deviation in x is given by k times z. The deviation in u is given by a different k times z. And therefore, with that substitution, my performance index now looks a lot neater. You see, I've just got z's here, z's here, z's here, z's here, with some different terms in between. But I also know that z has a simple model, zk plus 1 equals psi zk. So if I put all of this together, then this is what you're going to find. Again, I'm doing this quite fast because if you really want to follow the detail, you should just pause the video and look at the slides one at a time. So if I substitute in from my prediction equations into my new performance index, then you get this. And you'll notice this is quite similar to what we did in chapters 4 and 5. And the key thing is you end up with your initial condition in your augmented state. That's z naught, And inside the brackets, you've captured everything with this s term. And this s term obeys an equation given here. And that equation has got a w in it. And you'll see the w is defined neatly down here. So the algebra is straightforward once you've defined this kzs here and this kxss here. So the predicted performance can now be expressed in the following form. You'll see essentially what I've written here is z transposed s z. So I've got a augmented state times some um, matrix S times my augmented state. And what I can do is I can basically write this S in terms of its nine components. And clearly, the top left component, Sx, tells you the dependence on Xk. Then you've got this next component, Sxc, which tells you the relationship between X and C. We've got um, a component in the middle, Sc, which tells you the relationship between C and C, and so on. So there's nine terms, but some of those terms are common, so you can add them together, and that's you'll see why I have all these twos. So the bottom line is your performance index with a time varying cost can be represented by the J that we've got down here. And now if I minimize, oh, by the way, now that comes next. And um, what I've done here is just to keep life simple, you'll notice I've only written our future. I haven't included the D. In fact, wherever it says our future, you should be writing that. But that would have made the page even busier. So next, what I can do is I can minimize this performance index with respect to C future, which is a straightforward minimization. And you end up with your optimal control law is given here. C future is minus SC inverse times SCR times R future SXC times X. Or, I've not really changed anything there, have I? I accept, I think I've ex emphasized the point that really the R term should have the disturbance in it as well for completeness. So we've now got an explicit and simple expression for how our control law depends upon future target information and the current state. So the final unconstrained law. You'll remember that the actual control law that we're implementing was given in this box here. And the CK was just this little term at the end. So I need to combine these two terms. I've got my underlying control law. And added onto that, what I've done now is I've calculated the perturbation to the underlying control law. And that perturbation term is given here. So we've got a term 
which take, makes use of advanced information on the target. So you see it's explicit. If I have advanced information on the target, it's going to change my control law by this term here. And that tells you how the control law changes when you move from having no advanced knowledge to including advanced knowledge. You'll notice the underlying law already had an R in it, so it's saying if I've got no advanced knowledge and I want offset free tracking, that's the control law I use, as soon as I include advanced information, I get a slight change to the control law. And this is the slight change you get. And similarly, we did cover this in the earlier chapters, if the underlying feedback, this K, is not actually optimal, then you get some variation dependent on x, but if it's optimal, then you'll find that this SXC was actually zero. So in summary, this video has shown the algebra for how advanced information can be integrated into OMPC law, and the derivation we've used has used an autonomous model formulation. And you'll notice it is quite messy, and it doesn't matter how you do it, it won't be quite messy. We've shown that future target information has an explicit impact on the perturbation term CK, and that's what we wanted to know. How does this future target information come into the control law? Now, I will emphasize, I really haven't dwelt slowly on the algebra here, because that would take forever. And if you do want to understand this algebra, I suggest you go through this video and pause and read each step one at a time. The next video is going to demonstrate how this feedforward term actually works in practice using MATLAB examples.